For the rest of the program this morning, we have two familiar individuals up here. I will say nothing about the second one and leave that to Frank, but I feel that there may be some of you here who have been remiss in your homework and don't yet know how important in the conservative world Frank Capel is. He is the editor, publisher, writer, researcher of the two issues of Herald of Freedom, the regular one and the religious news one. He is a tremendous help to all of us working in this field. He does brilliant research, brilliant writing, and he is a most genial companion in addition to all of that. And uh, I don't want to do any more than say that he has a booth at the other end of the mezzanine where his latest publications are available, and uh, you will find them all of interest and a tremendous help in giving you ammunition for some of your later discussions. Mr. Frank Capel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I am allocated five minutes before I introduce the principal speaker. I'm going to utilize that five minutes to try to give you something to think about and to remember. In Holy Scripture, there is reference to Satan offering our Lord Jesus Christ all the nations of the world if he would bow before him. Using this as a basis, we, we who believe in the Bible recognize, therefore, there must be such a person as Satan. There must be satanic influences. A few years ago, Monsignor Christiani in France completed a book called Satan in the Modern World. As a result of 20 years of research, he came to the conclusion that there is such a thing as mass possession, satanic influences, and he singled out the communist conspiracy as being motivated uh, by Satan and his forces. To prove this, we would refer you to the takeover by the communists in various countries, Spain, and, for example, where they not only uh, killed the clergymen, but before doing so, they always tortured them. They always desecrated the churches. They always trampled on the crucifix. They turned uh, churches into... Uh, houses of uh, ill repute and put them to the most vile, uh, uh, handled in the most vile way, something that was not needed or required. And this has happened all over the world. There is always the singling out of the clergy for humiliation, desecration, uh, torture, and eventually death. Now, we have found that young people in this country when they start using drugs and become indoctrinated with the Marxist philosophy, they not only turn against their country, their family, authority, but they turn against their own religion, whatever their religion is or was. It always follows that these things work together. There is far more satanic influence in the world than people realize or recognize. Now. Dave Gamar, who writes for American Opinion, who's a very good friend of mine, will be coming out very shortly with an article on Satanism in America. And he will bring out the fact that it is being spread in the colleges, uh, books on this and literature, magazines, uh, being carried in the same stores that carry uh, communist literature. I would refer you to an article that I wrote myself some time ago concerning the first church of Satan in San Francisco. The clergyman, if we can call him that, who represents the devil, is one Anton Levey. Now, a few years ago, he conducted a marriage there. A Marxist man married the daughter uh, of a very fine family in a black satanic mass. Present at that wedding, and I have the photographs, was a famous theatrical personage, Barbara McNair, who has her own television program from coast to coast. The following year, she went with the Bob Hope troupe for Christmas, visiting the servicemen all through Southeast Asia and in our various military installations. 
And at the end of every program, she sang Silent Night, Holy Night. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we can become discouraged. We often can have despair overtake us when we see what is going on. But there is a weapon that we all have if we will just stop to think about it. We have truth, which the enemy does not have. We have God on our side. I sincerely believe that all of the people, all of you people who are fighting the enemies of God must know that God is on your side because you are fighting for him as well as our country and your family. And never at any time be concerned about your personal safety. I have been at this for 32 years and there's very little that, any, that they can do to anyone that they haven't done to me. We do not lose our people because of the pressures of the enemy. We lose them because of dissent from within. Over a thousand anti-communist organizations in the last 40 years have been disintegrated because of dissent from within. We hear of ecumenism. I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the same enemy which wishes to destroy the Roman Catholic Church, also which wishes to destroy the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and all Christianity. And if you want ecumenism, if you want true ecumenism, all people who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ get together and fight the enemy, forget about your doctrinal differences, and remember that we all either survive or we go down together. Our speaker was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1918, studied for the priesthood at St. Thomas Seminary in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. He has a Master of Arts degree in philosophy from the Catholic University in 1940 and a theological degree from the Catholic University in 1944, which qualifies uh, him in uh, theology. Ordained a priest in 1944 has been pastor of the Blessed Sacrament Church, Bridgeport, Connecticut, has lectured from coast to coast, written many articles for magazines, as you know, The Wanderer and so forth. He is on the National Council of the John Birch Society. Ladies and gentlemen, he has been covering from coast to coast, doing the very thing that I am talking about, bringing to the people the truth and knowledge through which to fight uh, our enemies. The, the various things which are popping up, the pornography, the birth control, the, the abortion, all of the things which are affecting uh, our society in addition to communism and which are inevitably traced back to the conspiracy. He is going to give you a report of some of his experiences on tour throughout the country. Ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to present to you my close and personal friend, Father Francis E. Fenton. Thank you, Frank, Colonel Bunker, Mrs. McKinney, Reverend Clergy, ladies and gentlemen, Frank and I are becoming institutionalized in this 11 a.m. spot at the rally on Sunday mornings. This is the third time I believe he has introduced me. I hope someday I'll be able to reciprocate the favor. Incidentally, he's now writing more and more frequently for the finest weekly news magazine in the country, The Review of the News. And if you haven't done so, I trust you will, you will purchase a copy of the current issue in which his article, Have the Communists Captured Newark? A rather rhetorical question, it seems to me, is a most informative article indeed. Have the Communists Captured Newark? In Frank Capel's article in the current issue, of the review of the news. I apologize uh, for this reason that this particular talk is includes the variations of the first personal pronoun, I, my, me, and mine, a large number of times. I feel rather self-conscious about it, but in this type of talk, 
I suppose is unavoidable. I've never tried to give this particular type of talk before, but I do hope it will be both interesting and motivational. Reminiscences from the lecture circuit. Public speaking in one form or another is one of the principal activities in the lives of most clergymen. This has certainly been true in my own case. However, a few years back, public speaking ceased to be for me merely one of my principal activities and became rather a substantial part of my life. In the past approximately two and a half years, I have given some 500 talks in about that same number of cities and towns in 45 of the 50 states under the auspices of the American Opinion Speakers Bureau. And this, aside from the so-called secondary engagements, which are scheduled in many areas in addition to the main program. In the course of my lecture tours, I would estimate that I have traveled some 150,000 miles, perhaps more, during that two and a half year period. All of which is not, I suppose, of any world-shaking significance. However, because my public speaking activities have occupied so much of my life over the last few years, I thought that a recounting of some of the experiences I have had and some of the things that have impressed me on these tours might, might be both of some interest to you and perhaps serve as a bit of encouragement to you in the pursuance of the vitally important tasks to which so many of you are giving so much of your lives. So then, for whatever value it may have, let me reminisce for a while about my life on the lecture circuit. First of all, I might observe that I would not recommend the lecture circuit as a permanent way of life for anyone. On a tour in several of the southern states some time back, I had 22 plane flights in 24 days, and on another, I stayed in 18 different motels on 18 consecutive nights. Whatever glamour, frequent, and extensive traveling around the country may appear to have for some, I, for one, have long since found living out of a suitcase for weeks at a time very unappealing indeed. While I do enjoy flying, and I pity the poor fellow on our lecture circuits who doesn't, and while I think that I will be forever fascinated by machines that fly like birds, airports are something else again. <laughs> Although I have seen no statistics on the subject, I would guess that the number of people traveling by plane today has increased several hundred percent over the number of those doing so, say, five or six years ago. In any case, the airports, especially those serving the larger cities, are, as many of you know, already bedlam. What they will be like once the 747s, the jumbo jets, are put into extensive use is indeed a dreadful thought to contemplate. As for the amount of time I have spent in airports over the past several years, I have no accurate notion, but it must be hundreds of hours indeed. And how often the time spent waiting for the plane is far longer than the time spent in the flight itself. If then there be any subjects about which I would consider myself some kind of an authority, a two of them would certainly be airplanes and motels. And so, if you are planning to do any traveling by plane or to stay in motels, please feel free to consult me for advice and recommendations. There will be no, no charge for the service. With all of the flying I have done, by the way, I've never had, thank God, any really dangerous experience, at least none that the pilot told the passengers about. However, there was one flight I had in which I was, frankly, rather frightened. It was on a one-engine plane. I had spoken in Cutbank, Montana the evening before and had to get to Kalispell, Montana the following morning to get a plane to Spokane, Washington. Uh, since there were no commercial flights out of Cutbank, it was a choice of either a several-hour drive or a charter plane. So I chose to fly a flight which went over a series of mountains in the Glacier National Park area. And believe me, they have mountains out there, not the hills that we in the Northeast call mountains. And I was told there were all kinds of wild animals in those mountains, as indeed there are. Anyway, it was necessary for the plane to fly at an altitude of about two and a half miles to be at a safe distance from the tops of the mountains. And this, I think, 
is a pretty good height for a one-engine plane, about two and a half miles. Well, while the flight seemed routine enough for the pilot, it was anything but routine for me. Uh, simply by looking out the window, I was very much aware of how high we were in so small a plane, and very much aware, too, that if that one engine gave up, we had no place to go but either against one of those mountains or down into what appeared to be a bottomless chasm to be devoured in short order by the inhabitants thereof. The occasional bumps and drops of the plane as it hit air pockets along the way, this of course added nothing to my composure. Well, we made it all right. Just another day's work for the pilot, I guess, but I admit a rather harrowing experience for me. And needless to say, I did do some serious praying on that particular flight. My lecture tours have taken me from New England to Florida to Alaska to Hawaii, and it seems most places in between. Only five states remain in which I have not spoken, Maine, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. Maybe I'll get to speak in those states before I retire, or the Speaker's Bureau retires me. Of the numerous and varied incidents that have occurred on my lecture tours, some have been humorous. On at least two occasions, the gentleman introducing me on the programs intended to say that I lectured widely, but to the amusement of all, it came out as Father Fenton lectures wildly. <laughs> some may think I do. At another time, instead of saying that I was a member of the National Council of the John Birch Society, as was intended, I was introduced as, of all things, a member of the National Council of Churches. <laughs> Two more opposite national councils would be very hard to imagine. Then there was the talk I gave at one of our Movement to Restore Decency programs in pointing out in the course of the talk the harm that can be done to a child in exposing him to sex information, which, for various reasons, he is not ready to receive, I had quoted the words of the psychiatrist, Dr. William McGrath, who had stated that a person who would attempt, in the name of sex education, to convey information of this kind to such a child, Dr. McGrath said, such a person ought to have a millstone tied around his neck and be cast into the sea. In the question period following the talk, a peacenik type of character arose and asked how I, supposedly a man of God, uh, could quote approvingly a statement advocating such violent action. How, how could you masquerade as a follower of Christ, he vehemently asked. Would Christ talk in such a fashion and suggest such violent action? Well, needless to say, he had no further questions when I informed him that Christ said it first. And that's, Those being the words of Christ, as quoted by Dr. McGrath, uh, words appearing in the 18th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. Other incidents have occurred at some of my talks which were anything but humorous, uh, such as the one that took place at one of our programs in the Milwaukee area. As I waited for the program to get started that evening, I noticed several priests entering the hall at intervals. Uh, since this is not an unusual occurrence, it would of itself have made no impression on me. However, the beards and long hair of some of them did, plus the fact that one or two of them appeared to be in the company of a number of unwashed, unshaven, barefooted creatures of various colors. I also observed that the priests sat in scattered sections of the hall, so I thought to myself, this should be indeed an interesting evening, and so it was. Shortly after I began to speak, the priests, God help the mark, the priests and their allies went into their act and began to heckle and move about and, in assorted ways, uh, tried to disconcert me and to cause as much confusion as possible in the audience. My mention of certain names elicited the expected response from them, the name of Senator Joseph McCarthy, for example, being roundly derided, <laughs> and that of Martin Luther King evoking loud applause. Every once in a while, every once in a while too, one or another of the priests would display the communist clenched fist salute. 
As these antics continued and it became more and more difficult for me to be heard, the audience was becoming more and more angered and began to shout back at the hecklers to keep quiet or leave, uh, to no avail, of course. One good lady, having taken all she could, arose, went over to one of the priests, raised her handbag, and proceeded to give him a resounding wallop on the head with it. <laughs> a violent action, to be sure, but greeted with loud applause by the audience. Uh, shortly after this, a man got up and went over to another one of the priests, and I am sure was only prevented by a couple of policemen from liquidating that priest on the spot. At this point, it seemed as though the situation would indeed get out of hand, which of course was exactly what the phony priests and their cohorts wanted. Especially did this appear to be true when, in the midst of the developing confusion, Lo and behold, who should arrive on the scene but the, quote, reverend, unquote, Grappi himself and a few of his henchmen uh, coming to restore law and order, no doubt. Mm. <laughs> well, it so happened that there were also on the scene that hectic evening some 35 of Milwaukee's finest, the local police, some in uniform, some in plain clothes. Thanks to them, we did manage to continue and to complete our program but it was an evening to remember. A good often comes out of evil, though, and in this case, there were at least two good results. One was that many of the people in the audience saw and heard at first hand what they otherwise would not perhaps have readily believed, and consequently, some of them have since become activists in the Americanist cause. Another good result occurred the following evening when I had a speech in another area of Milwaukee. Word had gotten round word having gotten round about the goings-on of the previous day, not only did we have standing room only that second evening, but a sizable number were turned away, and a booming business and literature sales was conducted. The troublemakers showed up again, but because they had not purchased tickets in advance, they couldn't get in at all, and so the best they could do was to mill around outside. In the course of the evening, it began to rain heavily, and so they got a good soaking in the process. God is good. <laughs> and, uh, then there was a motor read program in New Orleans a couple of months later. As I glanced over the audience a few minutes before the program was to get underway, uh, whom did I spot sitting toward the front of the hall? The one of the same priests who had been at the program in Milwaukee that I have just described. Uh, since I knew he was up to no good, I informed the police who were present to expect trouble, one of the policemen being the master of ceremonies that evening. <laughs> Before the program started at all, the people who were sitting in the area close by the priest began to move to other parts of the hall because of the remarks that this priest was making. As soon as the program began, this character began his antics, designed, to, of course, to create as much disturbance as possible and to distract the audience from the program itself. So, after he had carried on briefly, the police went over to him and asked him to leave. He refused to do so and then went limp on the floor. So the police proceeded to drag him out and arrested him. The New Orleans police evidently don't waste any time with such characters. God bless them. By all means, support your local police and keep them independent. <laughs> Incidentally, this particular priest, according to the news reports of the incident I have described, while he afterward retracted it, told the police that evening that he was a communist. And this same priest, by the way, was, the last I heard, a field representative for the National Federation of Priests' Councils, Father Francis Henry Mahoney. Then there was the time, not long, or not, not long after the Kent State tragedy, when, in a question period following one of my talks, a young man, or woman, who knows for sure these days, <laughs> arose, <laughs> arose and asked me to request the audience to observe a minute of silent prayer 
for, as he put it, those college students who had been murdered by the National Guard at Kent State University in Ohio. Although I proceeded at once to correct his use of words in describing the affair, yet I was on the spot, which I am sure is where the questioner wanted me to be. I could hardly refuse, I thought, to uh, a request for a prayer in such circumstances. So, the minute of prayer was duly observed by the audience. Then, immediately following this, I proceeded to ask everyone present if they would now observe a second minute of silent prayer for the law enforcement officers around the country who, in the performance of their duties, had been killed by the Black Panthers over the last year. And that suggestion, I assure you, was an all but completely spontaneous one because prior to saying that, I had no idea of how I could effectively respond to this rather clever bit of propaganda against the police by the questioner. And this, I think, is but one example of where, from time to time, were it not for the grace of God, I would indeed have been very much on the spot. Of some interest to you, may be a few observations of mine relating to my talks at colleges around the country. Oh, I've not talked at many of them. After all, I'm a priest in good standing, and I'm promoting God, family, and country, so that's not the in thing at the college campus these days. I have talked at about 15 of them over the past couple of years, but these few times I have invariably turned out to be, they have invariably turned out to be an interesting, though somewhat upsetting, experience. Uh, since the pattern is pretty much the same, let me give you, as more or less typical, a brief description of my most recent experience in speaking on a college campus. This particular one happened to be a Catholic college, which colleges, by the way, are becoming ever more and more difficult to recognize as such. The college to which I'm now referring is Quincy College in Quincy, Illinois, operated by the Franciscan Fathers. I spoke there one evening some three months ago. Now I knew it was a Catholic college because I was told it was. Believe me, I would never have known it otherwise. There were some 125 young people present, some half of whom were of the beatnik variety. A short meeting was held before my talk at which, without a dissenting voice, it was voted to demonstrate in support of the California table grape boycott the next day at a local supermarket. I was then very haphazardly introduced and spoke for about 45 minutes with a question period following of about equal length. I was frequently heckled and my statements ridiculed throughout the talk, while the question period was more of a prolonged verbal assault on me than an occasion for asking questions. All of the questions were antagonistic, some of them were offensive, and one of them included the use of quite vulgar language, to put it mildly. Any mention by me of patriotic Americans was a laughing matter, while names like Cesar Chavez and Jerry Rubin were sure to draw a round of applause. Incidentally, Jerry Rubin was the previous speaker at that particular, quote, Catholic, unquote, college, Jerry Rubin. Two names, incidentally, are usually good for a few laughs on most college campuses today, the names of J. Edgar Hoover and Almighty God. Several priests I might note, though not identifiable as such by their wearing apparel, several priests were present throughout the program at that college. I knew they were priests because I asked them. Uh, they were faculty members, and not one of them at any time throughout the whole evening so much as asked, much less told their students, even to give me the courtesy of a respectful hearing. Indeed, I do think, looking back in that particular program, that if some of these students who were becoming rather violent themselves, uh, I think if they had chosen to draw and quarter me on the spot, my fellow priest, God help the mark, would have sat there and observed. Such that is a brief account of my lecture appearance, appearance at one Catholic college. Sad to say, it was not an unusual experience. While the harassment I have described might be more extensive at most secular colleges, with the faculty members often getting into the act, yet the difference between the two is only one of degree. The lack of discipline and respect for authority and a widespread spirit of permissiveness, these are commonplace. 
And the same is increasingly true in many high schools. However, I do not mean to imply that I think that the cause is a hopeless one as far as the young people at our colleges are concerned. There is a sizable segment of wholesome, clean-cut young Americans in attendance at colleges and universities around the country who do not support or participate in the leftist activities on campus. Although they too are constantly subjected to the liberal socialist indoctrination which passes for education at most American colleges and universities today, yet many of them can be reached and some of them can become and are becoming staunch activists for the conservative Americanist cause. Now, while I do, I do not think, while I do not think that this can be accomplished to any extent on the college campus itself in most cases because of the environment therein, yet it can be done if we can get the type of young people we seek to attend our film forums, read our literature, listen to our speakers and so forth for a sufficient period of time. The proof that this can be done is that it is being done, as is evidenced, for example, by the increasing number of youth chapters of the John Birch Society which are being formed around the country. And a good example, of course, we just had from Jim Reinhardt and his daughter. While there's no denying that the challenge here is a formidable one, we must nonetheless successfully meet it. As the Dan Smoot Report states in its April 13th, 1970 issue, if we lose a full generation of children, there is little hope of restoring our republic. But judging from my experience in my travels around the country over the last several months, I would say that the only area that I have found to be a disheartening one and where we have the most difficult challenge facing us is on the college campus. Elsewhere, the picture as I see it, the picture is increasingly encouraging. And parenthetically, since I am rather active in the John Birch Society, the understatement of the year, and since I am quite thoroughly dedicated to its principles and purposes, when I use uh, the personal pronouns we and our, I have in mind primarily at least the John Birch Society, although other authentic anti-communist organizations and individuals who share our principles and convictions would be implicitly included. Close parentheses. Far more favorable interest in the JBS is being shown, for example, and a far more receptive hearing is being given to us by the local media in many areas than we have previously received. Again, I speak only from my own experience, but the press conferences I have had and the newspaper coverage of my talks in recent months, while hardly ideal, of course, they have been, I think, at least satisfactory almost always, and a number of them very much so. I would make a somewhat different observation about the few TV panel discussions in which I have participated. While I think and I hope that our side came off all right on those occasions, yet the idea of the producers as to what they seem to consider a balanced program is something else again. I was on the program here in Boston some nine months ago in which the topic was sex education. Of the nine participants in the discussion, only one was on my side. Obviously, that was not a fair reflection of the thinking of the American people on this subject. And then, about three months back, I was on a panel-type program on a Chicago television station. A number of subjects were discussed, but the point I want to make is the way in which all sides are supposedly represented. Of the five or six participants, no one but myself could possibly be considered conservative by any stretch of the imagination. Some of the other participants being Jerry Rubin, Michael Harrington, and Senator William Proxmire of Wisconsin. Well, I suppose in a way, this is really a compliment to us John Birchers. The TV producers evidently figure that with a member of the John Birch Society as one of the panelists, at least three or four left-wingers must be included to balance the program. Also, 
very encouraging of late are the increasing size of the audiences our speakers are getting, and especially since the quality of the people in attendance is far more important than mere numbers, especially the increasingly encouraging amount of our literature being purchased at our programs and the number of people signing up for film forums, John Birch Society membership, and so forth. During the last several months, I might note, most of my, thought, most of my talks have been on the John Birch Society in programs sponsored by local chapters of the John Birch Society. In terms of literature sales, with audiences of, say, only about 200, we have had literature sales in excess of $100 on several occasions. As far as audience size is concerned, I have had a number of them in recent months of between 300 and 450, and in Rome, Georgia, a population about 60,000, in Rome, Georgia, there were 800 in attendance for our John Birch Society program. In proportion to the size of the population, however, I have never had an audience even close to the size of the one we had for a motor read program some months back in a town called Sauk Center, Minnesota. There are four towns in that area with a total population of about 7,000 people, and there were more than 500 present for our program that particular evening. That's 7% of the total population. Imagine getting 7% of a city of, say, 200,000 people. That would be 14,000 people. In fact, I was sure, as I wrote to Chip Wood and Jack McManus shortly after, I was sure that that must be some sort of a record for the American Opinion Speakers Bureau, 7% of the population. Well, I was promptly informed by Jack McManus that it was not because he had 10% of the area population at a talk of his in North Dakota. So that took care of that. One reason, by the way, for that impressive attendance in Sauk Center, Minnesota, I didn't know he was going to be in the audience when I got this talk together. One reason for that impressive attendance at Sauk Center, Minnesota, is a Catholic priest by the name of Father Morris Landweir. Boy, he's going to hate me for this. A, mo a most dedicated member and section leader, section leader, I say, of the John Birch Society. And Indeed, as I recall noting in my lecture there that evening last November, rarely in recent years have I talked with a fellow priest with whom I had more in common. And he has, incidentally, he has nine or ten chapters in his section. Uh, may his likes in the John Birch Society speedily increase among clergymen of all faiths. And then there are the husband and wife in Moline, Illinois, one a section leader, the other a chapter leader. The wife runs a beauty salon, a rather sizable one, I would suppose, because she has some 450 regular customers and employs nine young women as beauticians. Five of these nine young women are members of the John Birch Society. <laughs> One of them being the chairman of the Support Your Local Police Committee, and another a youth chapter leader. These people are also in the audience today. Of the four non-members, most, if not all, belong to one or another of our ad hoc committees. Needless to say, the John Birch Society is doing very nicely in Moline, Illinois. Um, then there is the Midwestern town in which I spoke one evening and was introduced by the mayor. He began his introduction of me by saying, quote, as you all know, I am a member of the John Birch Society, unquote. I didn't know this until he said so, but evidently everyone else in the audience did. I guess it's safe to say we don't have many cities and towns around the country as yet whose mayors are members of the John Birch Society. <laughs> One of these days. Another heartening situation in the John Birch Society, it seems to me, is the number of members who have large families. <laughs> Recruitment being so vital a part of our activities. <laughs> it is good to realize that we have such a sort of built-in source of membership as this. 
I recall conversing briefly some months back with three married couples, all six of whom were members of the John Birch Society and who had a total of 34 children. Why, I thought to myself, there is the potential of three Birch Society chapters right there in just three families. <laughs> As for the inconveniences endured, the sacrifices undergone, the dedication shown by members of the John Birch Society across the country, well, I could tell you scores of examples of these. Just a few weeks ago, I met a family from Canada, the John Birch Society members who drive some 130 miles each month round trip from north of Montreal to a town in northern New York State for their chapter meetings. In fact, when I met them, they had just made that trip the evening before for their meeting, and they came down again the next day to hear my talk. However, if I start telling you such stories as this, interesting and motivating, though they would surely be, I'll be talking to you all day. And besides, I am sure that many of you could match such true stories of mine, of the dedication of our members, with examples of your own. Believe me, no member of the John Birch Society traveling around the country need ever feel alone or without friends, because wherever he might be, the chances are that he can locate one or more fellow members without much trouble, and once he does, the chances are, too, that he will feel right at home within minutes. Wherever you go, wherever you go in this land of ours today, and I mean this almost literally, you will find the John Birch Society. And if you yourself are a member, you are sure to find kindred souls and an hospitable reception, an experience. An experience which I have had scores of times. How well I recall as but one example my stay in Fairbanks, Alaska, while on a lecture tour in Alaska uh, two years ago. Now, Fairbanks is but some 500 miles south of the Arctic Circle, and that, at least as we Easterners see it, is a long, long way off. But we have, and this was two years ago, we have three chapters of the John Birch Society in Fairbanks, Alaska, and I felt just as much at home with the John Birchers there in Eskimo land as I did in my hometown. And the same was true whether I was in Ord, Nebraska, or Hattiesburg, Mississippi, or Cutbank, Montana, or El Paso, Texas, or Honolulu, Hawaii. I don't suppose I've ever written a talk of this length, which it has taken me longer to write than this one. The reason being that I have been on the lecture circuit almost continually for the last three months. And so I've had to put this talk together in dribs and drabs, as time allowed, while on tour. However... Of all of my tours of the last several years, these most recent ones have been far and away the most successful. I mention this point because these talks, which I have given in some 25 states during the last few months, these talks have been, with but two or three exceptions, and as I have previously noted, they've been talks on the John Birch Society sponsored by local chapters of the John Birch Society. The audiences turning out for these John Birch Society talks have been some 20% larger than those I have had on any of the ad hoc committees over the last two or three years. And the results have been most encouraging in just about every respect. On my April tour in one city in Illinois, 16 people joined the society that evening, and in another city in that state, 13 joined. In May, in a city in the Northeast, 18 people joined that evening, and 77 people, in an audience of somewhat over 300, turned in cards expressing an interest in film showings, presentations, and so forth. I just got a letter the other day from people in the Carmel, New York area, and they tell me that 12 new members joined the evening of our program there. And so the story goes. In the 70 or so talks that I have given on the John Burt Society in that many cities and towns, over the past four or five months, with but few exceptions, all have been successful programs, some of them strikingly so. Incidentally, speaking of encouraging signs, in one of the larger cities in New York State a few weeks back, 14 policemen attended a John Birch Society presentation, including several police officers. At the conclusion of the presentation that day, 
all 14 policemen joined the John Birch Society. And uh, we have it right from Belmont that um, the month of June just passed saw the largest increase in new chapters in the John Burt Society in any month in the last four years. Now the reason for my stressing the increasingly encouraging results which our efforts are getting around the country, apart from the good effect on our morale which it provides, the reason is to make the point, as many of you realize already, that the time is ripe for getting our John Burt Society story to the American people, and especially for reaching the caliber of American we seek to join our ranks and to work with us in carrying out the Herculean tasks we have undertaken. If our fellow Americans cannot see today that what we have been saying for 11 years would happen, is happening before their very eyes, then the cause for which we labor would indeed be a lost one. But the fact is that they are seeing it, and more and more, they are giving us a hearing and responding to our pleas. And so those of you, if there be any such here present, who may perhaps have become somewhat disheartened at the seeming absence of more concrete evidence of the success of your efforts over the years, and as a result have become less active, I very earnestly urge you to start pulling at the oars once again with all your might, because in my judgment, the tide is at long last beginning to turn. And it could just be, God alone knows, it could just be that your return to the battle at this time as a full-time warrior could be a decisive factor in bringing about the ultimate victory that I believe is now beginning to appear on the horizon. However, <laughs> however indistinct the outlines of that victory may be at this point. But no talk on this subject involving as it does the American Opinion Speakers Bureau, no talk would be complete without a word of high praise and appreciation to those who have been primarily responsible for the efficient operation and ever-increasing effectiveness of that Bureau, namely Mr. Chipwood and Mr. Jack McManus. These two men on the East Coast and their counterparts on the West Coast, together with those who work with them in both locations. In the 10-month period between September 1969 and June 1970, some 2,000 speeches have been delivered across the country, and at least one in Canada, of which I know, under the auspices of the American Opinion Speakers Bureau. Some 2,000 speeches. The innumerable details involved in this huge undertaking have required and have received the cooperation of many, many dedicated Americans from coast to coast, to be sure, a fact of which I am very much aware. But the lion's share of the plaudits here must surely go to those I have named. I think they do a magnificent job indeed, and I simply take this occasion to say so. I have always been optimistic as to the ultimate outcome of this battle in which so many of us are so totally engaged. One of the reasons for my optimism is the consequence of my extensive lecture travels, which has been the subject of my talk this morning. In those travels, I have met literally thousands of members of the John Birch Society and have become well acquainted with a number of them. Time and time again, I have seen and been deeply impressed by this great body of wonderful Americans and their dedicated labors to restore and to preserve our glorious American heritage. To have met and known and worked with these people, this has been for me a most humbling and gratifying experience. How often over the years, in his monthly bulletins, has Mr. Robert Welsh described the members of the John Birch Society as the finest body of men and women in the world today. I heartily agree, and it is because this is true, and because we have the truth on our side, that I have always strongly believed that victory will be ours in God's own good time, 
and with his indispensable help. Although it would be somewhat less than honest of me, were I to convey the impression to you that I think victory is assured, yet I do firmly believe that the turning of the tide is not far distant and that ultimate victory is at least within sight, however remote it may yet seem to be and however the pathetic condition of our country would appear to disprove and to belie my optimism. And so in conclusion, I would emphasize three things. One, America can and please God will be saved. <laughs> Two, the John Birch Society offers the best, if not the only reasonable hope for accomplishing this. <laughs> and three, the time was never more opportune than it is right now for the John Birch Society to get its message to the American people and to recruit into our ranks the caliber of American we seek. Let us then, on the occasion of this banner celebration of America's Declaration of Independence, let us rededicate ourselves to the principles upon which our American Republic was founded and let us commit ourselves anew to work unstintingly for the cause of God, family, and country, so that whatever be the final outcome, each and every one of us one day can say in all truth, I have done my best. The rest is up to God. Thank you. I know I'm going to have quite a time trying to convince this audience at the rally that the John Birch Society has nothing to do with this rally. 